674 BC. Torches flickered in the royal hall as King Asarhaddon dined alongside his human advisors and trusted war dogs. His head was shaved clean in the Assyrian style, bringing focus to his intense gaze, and pronounced brows cast his deep-set eyes in an eternal grave expression that commanded immediate respect and obedience. Esarhaddon carried himself with a more refined and contemplative poise compared to prior warrior kings. He would stroke his beard in pensive silence when petitioners spoke, weighing responses with philosophical depth. His movements and gestures conveyed solemn gravity as one aware of the heavy burden of leadership required to maintain his father Sennacherib's vast empire. At the head of the table sat Asher Etililani, leader of the Hound forces flanked by his seasoned advisors, Belu and Kalbi. Both dogs had grown into massively fit beasts after years of rigorous training. Belu's dark brindle coat was adorned with scars earned in skirmishes along the kingdom's border. Kalbi remained swift despite his colossal size, his jaw still strong enough to crush anything unlucky enough to end up in his mouth. He moved with the slow deliberation of a titan, iron-spiked collar accentuating his pronounced neck and jowls. Calculated confidence marked each movement, eyes smoldering like banked coals, ready to unleash fiery chaos upon provocation. Baloo was a living monument to calculated ferocity, his imposing presence a blunt reminder that savagery lay coiled beneath civility's surface. Kalbi glided with scholarly poise, each step unhurried yet pulsing with precision. His speckled coat of sandy brown, tapering to black paws, stood out against the flanking brutes like a philosophy amidst warriors. Only the notches in his drooping ears Mementos of long-ago battles hinted at the strength beneath his sagely calm. Kalbi's eyes gleamed with generations of accumulated insight, flickering between distant memory and present opportunity. For Kalbi, force began where wisdom failed, with balance guiding his measured strength. The two were legendary among the kingdom's dogs. Both dogs stood eye to eye with the king's stallions, outweighing them by several hundred pounds. As servants cleared the meal and refilled wine glasses, talk turned to plans for an upcoming campaign against Elamite insurgents. We must deploy the dogs alongside the chariot teams on the front lines when we siege their mountain citadel, urged Belu, teeth bared with intensity. Let us loose to wreak havoc and break their ranks, paving the way for the infantry advance. Absolutely not, objected General Zababa Shuma Idina, the king's senior human military advisor. We cannot risk our finest war dogs by sending them into the fray first. They would be decimated by Elamite arrows. General Zababa had a presence befitting his senior military rank, his thin frame standing tall beneath bronze armor etched with scenes of Assyrian conquest. His angular face was framed by neatly trimmed black beard and hair. His piercing pale eyes, a gift from his mother, constantly assessed surroundings with shrewd intensity. Zababa carried himself with uptight poise and precision in keeping with Assyrian discipline and order. When he marched through the barrack halls, soldiers snapped crisply into salute, not daring to meet his severe gaze. In council he spoke with arrogant authority, ever positioning himself as the voice of hard-won wisdom through endless campaigns. Even in rest, the general seemed to radiate bottled intensity, his features never fully relaxing into casual calm. He moved with purpose at all times, hands never far from the sword and dagger hilts at his belt. Like any career soldier, he seemed eternally prepared for some hazard to emerge that required lethal response. Any sign of weakness in others earned his swift, ferocious contempt. You underestimate our capabilities, Kelby growled. Did hounds not prove ourselves indispensable 
in countless battles under King Sennacherib. Our skills have only grown through the generations since we last used them in significant battle. That was long ago in your youth, dismissed General Zababa. You and Belu may have ambition, but most of the other dogs have gone soft from easy living in the city. They lack the hardened muscle required for frontline combat. Insulted snarls erupted from the other dogs at the table. Asher Etililani raised his paw to silence them. Mind your tongue, Zababa, warned King Esarhaddon. You tread on dangerous ground insulting creatures, once trained by the great Gula himself. My apologies, your grace, sighed General Zababa. I intended no disrespect. I merely suggest we utilize the dog's skills more prudently. Have them secure our supply lines, patrol the city outskirts, and guard the walls should worst come to worst. But squandering them as the vanguard would be foolish. Belu slapped his paw on the stone table, rattling goblets. Patrol duty? You would relegate the fiercest warriors this kingdom has ever bred to mere guard work? Unacceptable. I believe the general has gone soft in the muscle between his ears. The other dogs erupted in howls of protest. The king raised a hand to silence them. I understand your protests, loyal hounds. But consider, we must convince the people that human and dog forces stand united, each playing their part. If the dogs shed blood on the front lines while our men guard the rear, what message does that send? Belu reluctantly conceded the king's point. Though once a formidable fighter himself, Esar Haddon was a diplomat at heart, concerned with optics. Very well, your grace, Belu grumbled. We shall settle for a secondary role in this campaign. But I warn you, Leash us for too long and the fangs of future generations may turn on mankind. The nightmare we all work together to avoid may yet emerge from the shadows. Sometimes passivity conquers good faster than evil ever could. Gasps arose from the humans at the implicit threat. Calbi quickly intervened. Forgive my old friend, your highness. Grief at our reduced status makes his tongue run loose. He shot Belu a warning glance. We live but to serve Assyria, and you are its king. Esaradan looked them both up and down grimly. See that devotion continues. This conversation is over. You are dismissed. The humans filtered out as the dog leaders gathered in the courtyard, murmuring angrily in their native language, unknown to humans save for a precious few, none of which were represented here. The king's advisor is a milk-livered fool. If he distrusts his greatest warrior so, spat Belu. Patience, brother, answered Kalbi. Our time will come again, for now, we must bide our strength, but the old fire still smolders within us. He drew a claw across a stone pillar, releasing sparks. Dawn's light filtered into the royal hall as King Esar Haddon held council over dates, honeyed breads, and other breakfast fare. Once again, he sat surrounded by his human advisors, along with the dog leaders Asher Etil Ilani, Belu, and Kalbi. The mood was tense after the heated disagreement the night prior over the dog's battlefield role. Belu's ears twitched angrily as he awaited the king's words. Izzah Haddon set down his goblet and cleared his throat. Honored companions, I have carefully considered your positions 
regarding the upcoming campaign against the Elamite rebels, and I believe I have arrived at a prudent compromise. The dogs perked up anxiously. To preserve the lives of our cherished war dogs, you shall not take part in this battle. My human legions shall face the Elamites alone. Stunned silence gripped the hall. Belu stood up and stepped away from the table, the hair on his back raised. Your Grace, I must object in the strongest terms. You cannot simply cast aside our centuries of loyalty and service. War dogs have fought and died alongside Assyrian troops since this kingdom's founding. Essa Haddon raised a hand placatingly, which is exactly why I must preserve you noble hounds now. Too much sacred blood has soaked foreign soil. I cannot in good conscience squander more. The dogs growled uncertainly, conflicted, but Belu would not relent. You cannot be sincere. We do not fear death in service to Assyria. We never have. Send us into the fray as vanguard, and we shall carve a path through the Elamites' ranks. General Zababa scoffed. You would throw your lives away for vain glory. His grace makes the wise choice here. The only choice. Vain glory, Belu snarled, rounding on the human advisor. You truly know nothing of us dogs. Glory means nothing. We fight because that fire, that savage joy, courses through our veins. We were born and bred for protection and the kill. Restrain us at your own peril. Or are you so comfortable in your tower that you have completely disconnected from all reality? Wars aren't won because militaries take turns letting warriors fight. That's how children and puppies play. Esser hadn't slammed his fist on the table. Enough! I will hear no more protests. The dogs shall remain here, safeguarding the city. That is my decree as king. Knowing better than to question the finality of his decree, Calbi stepped forward and bowed his great head. As you command your grace, he turned with a snarl, baring his teeth. Come, Belu, you leave with me. But Belu stood firmly rooted, a low growl rumbling in his chest as he stared down the human king. The two locked eyes. Finally, Belu spoke, his rough voice edged with danger. So be it. Hide us away if you must. But we both know this frail illusion of peace cannot last if you disrespect our role in this kingdom. When Assyria's enemies next bear their fangs, you will call on us again, and you would be wise to pray that we choose to answer if only because the old fire has not deserted us. With that he turned and stormed out, the other dogs trailing behind, heads held high. Esser Haddon watched them depart, unsettled but resolute. Wise judgment, my king, said General Zababa gently, leaning in to speak quietly behind a hand in the direction of the king's ear. Your human troops will prove their valor against the Elamites. I hope you are right, old friend, sighed the king. His mind flickered with images of the ferocious dogs in their glory days, slaughtering enemies by the hundreds, consumed with battle lust. Could his men truly match that savage vigor? His gut churned uneasily, but the decree was made. Belu watched bitterly from the city walls as King Esar Haddon's army marched out towards Egypt. By his quick estimate, they must have been ten thousand strong, spears and standards glinting in the morning sun. But his canine senses picked up thinly veiled cracks in their swagger. That fool king left his fiercest warriors behind. 
yet still his men strut about as if they've already claimed victory, Bellu growled. At his side stood Kalbi and Asher Etil Ilani, along with a dozen other hardened war dogs. They bristled as the human troops filed past, incensed at being left behind. Look at them preen in their polished armor, Kalbi grumbled, as though that will protect them from Egyptian axes and arrows. Armor cannot substitute for true ferocity. Chest protection is a waste. They need only protect their backs. Belu noted the overconfidence on many faces. And I see the king's useless nephews ride in the rear, more obsessed with glory than wise strategy. He snorted derisively. We dogs would never tolerate such weak, entitled pups in our pack. Asher Etil Ilani, snout scarred from no fewer than a half dozen battles, sighed deeply. I fear the humans have forgotten the bloody lessons we learned together long ago under King Sennacherib. War is not a game. Victory depends on both tooth and steel. The other dogs rumbled in solemn agreement. For a moment, the hounds fell silent, each privately mourning the fraying relationship between their two proud communities. At last, the final regiment marched through the gates, anxious citizen crowds cheering them on. As the dust settled, Bilu turned to his brethren. Come, let us return home and watch no further. Perhaps they will prove their might without us. The novel and serialized audiobook Hounds of War is written and produced by James Eldridge. It is a work of fiction. However, the third king of the Sargonid dynasty, Esarhaddon, is most famous for his conquests, which made his empire the largest the world had ever seen and for his reconstruction of Babylon, which had been destroyed by his father. Despite a relatively short and difficult reign and being plagued by paranoia, depression and constant illness, Esarhaddon remains recognized as one of the greatest and overall most successful Assyrian kings. Near the end of Esarhaddon's seventh year on the throne, the king invaded Egypt this invasion, which only a few Assyrian sources discuss, ended in what some scholars have assumed was possibly one of Assyria's worst defeats ever. To see images from this story or purchase the book in hardcover or Kindle versions, visit houndsofwarbook.com.